Ms. Vaughn? Hello. Hello, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Monning and Morell. Thank you for hearing us today. Our counties, I want to give Frank and his counties great credit for doing an incredible job reducing the number of kids in foster care, 46% less since 1998. At the same time, sadly, the number of youth who are turning 18 in care has remained consistent at about 4,000 every year. California is actually a leader in the development of specialized youth permanency services. We know how to achieve permanent families for these youth, and we've demonstrated conclusively that after a startup period, these services can be sustained at no net cost to the county or state. Specialized youth permanency services are not included in the CCR recommendations. In 2006, the legislature allocated three years of funding to five older youth adoption pilots. 82% of the youth referred achieved permanent families. The counties were required to track and report the savings that they achieved, but the counties weren't required to reinvest those savings to sustain the services long term. The funding sunset just as these services were hitting their real stride. Nonetheless, the programs reassigned staff and went back to business as usual, losing the opportunity to sustain these services long term at no net cost. There are many reasons why this happened, many of them based on the emerging field of behavioral economics. In our budget proposal, we recommend that we give our youth another chance, that we try again, this time integrating the lessons that we learn from those pilots. In the materials that you were given, there is a chart that explains the difference, compares the, those pilots with our current proposal for you to take a look at as you're ready. This time the funds would be allocated to two counties based on a competitive RFP. In order for the counties to be considered, they would need to commit to tracking and this time reinvesting the savings to sustain the programs long term. Five years of funding would result in services into perpetuity and thousands of youth getting what they need and deserve, love and longing to last a lifetime. I welcome your questions and ask for your support. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mr. Blaylock. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Blaylock. I'm the director of youth law programs at Bay Area Legal Aid, where we provide civil legal assistance to youth under the age of 25, including current and former foster youth. I've also had the pleasure of um, participating in the continuum of care reform, um, including working with the steering committee and several of the subcommittees, including the fiscal um, work group. Um, I've been asked today to give a brief overview of one of the issues that's, that's come out of the CCR, um, which is relative funding. Um, you just heard from um, several people, including Frank, the, the importance of um, relatives to our foster care system, relatives are the backbone of our foster care system. But strangely, um, and largely because of unanticipated consequences because of the budget process, we actually support relatives the least, even though relative placement is where we most want our foster children. Um, in California, a child placed with a relative um, has to meet arcane and outdated federal eligibility rules to receive foster care benefits. Um, California is the only state in the nation right now that does not pay approved relative caregivers state foster care benefits if they don't meet federal eligibility rules. Um, California pays state foster care benefits in every other placement, group homes, FFAs, licensed non-relatives, non-relative extended family member placements, uh, but not to relatives. Um, if the child can make it to permanency, then California is a leader in providing funding and support through our subsidized guardianship program that was mentioned earlier, our King Gap program, and the adoption assistance programs. Um, but unfortunately, many of these youth can't make it to permanency because there's no basic foster care benefit payment to support them, and the caregiver and child have no control over how long that foster care case needs to be open, and thus no control over when the subsidized permanency payment can begin. Instead, California pays foster children who are not federally eligible and living with relatives, uh, CalWORKs. Um, I can use the example of my clients as why that's not a tenable or good solution. Um, CalWORKs is at most right now $369. It uh, recently went up. Um, a foster care payment for a child who's at least 15 years old, in contrast, is um, $820 at minimum. 
Um, so say my client Abby, who's 15, placed with a stranger, would receive $820 for her care. She then moves to her grandmother's house, and 15 to 20% of all relative placements are seniors. Um, where Abby and her worker in the state everybody wants her to be, um, she would actually only get $369. Um, in grandma's house. So it's the same child with the same basic needs, but her funding's been cut by uh, more than half. Um, if she has special needs um, and she was placed with a stranger, she would actually get a special increment for those needs. The reason why is because California's foster care benefit rate is now based on a study out of UC Davis that calculated the minimum amount of money that would be necessary to provide adequate care. Um, so food, shelter, transportation for a foster child. Um, the non needy CalWORKs grant, though, that we give Abby when she's placed with a relative, when she's not federally eligible, is not connected to anything. Um, and so it's kind of stuck at that 39% of the federal poverty level. So if Abby has special needs, say so she has severe mental health needs, um, in LA, maybe she would qualify for the D rate, that would be about $1,300 for her care. Um, Abby, with the exact same needs but placed with a relative, she would only receive that 369 It actually gets worse when we're looking at sibling groups, because we very much want to keep sibling groups together. So if we place Abby with her sibling, um, with a non-relative, with a stranger, then at minimum she would get 1640 a month. Um, but if we instead we place them with grandma, where we want them, um, they would only receive 577. Um, looking at the system and looking through the, at the CCR lens too, this is especially egregious because if the placement fails, um, so that so say for example, um, grandma's not able to kind of hold on to Abby because of her special needs, Abby could end up at a level 12 group home. That's where over half of all of our kids are who are in a group home. And of course, that's over $8,000. Um, how do we get here? I mean, this appears largely to be an un unanticipated consequence of the budget process, because CalWORKs until very recently has been periodically cut. Um, meanwhile, foster care benefits have been attached to a minimum adequacy standard and therefore gone up. So as a result, these foster children who are not federally eligible are being placed into um, that abject poverty, that 39% of the federal poverty level. And so caregivers um, trying to do what we all want them to do and they want to do, go into debt, take on other jobs, downsize their housing, and make very hard choices about extracurricular activities like sports and dance in order to hang on to these children. Um, California could fix this through the budget process. Um, there are approximately 22,000 foster children placed with relatives in the state, as Mr. Rose was talking about earlier, to around 37% in any given year um, placed with Ken. And we estimate about a third of these children are not federally eligible and are only being provided um, that CalWORKs rate for their care, meaning about a third of those children are placed with relatives directly in the poverty with all the resultant statistical outcome probabilities that we want to avoid for these children that come with poverty, less educational achievement, poor health outcomes, less earnings as young adults. Um, by addressing this disparity through the budget process, um, it would result in a more efficient system, a fiscal structure that would support and promote the outcomes we all most want and adequate, adequately supports our foster children and the relative caregivers who are taking care of them. Um, and I'm, I'm also happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Schroeder. And Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much. Carol Schroeder with the California Alliance of Child and Family Services. Um, you can glean from this the interrelationship of all the things that folks are talking about around this table. Uh, and I just want to say uh, from the outset that the, uh, the Alliance is absolutely supportive of every one of these budget requests. Ours has to do with the social workers in foster family agencies, which are critical to supporting the kids and families who are cared for in, uh, through that, that process. Um, the funding for social workers in foster family agencies is contained in that FFA rate. Um, that social work component has been frozen since 2001. It was cut by about 10% in 2009. And so the amount that's built into that component of the social work rate right now for the salary for social workers is $15.13 an hour. The problem is that at that level, FFAs cannot recruit and retain qualified social workers. Um, it is not uncommon among our member agencies to experience a turnover of 50% in their social workers in any given year. I think that you're going to hear from one of our member agencies during public comment that lost every one of their social workers, save one in a given year, all for the same reasons. They could not compete in terms of salary and benefits. When a foster family agency loses a social worker, it's a loss for the agency, but really who it's a loss for are the children and families that that, that social worker is working with. And with that comes disruption of permanency plans, uh, it comes the, uh, the further uh, loss and grief uh, that kids feel with the loss of yet another uh, significant adult in their lives. 
And this is a time when kids are, that we're working with are presenting with greater and greater challenges. Uh, so um, what's happened at this point is that FFAs, you know, the question is, well, why now? FFAs have reached a, a tipping point. They're spending down their reserves. They've tapped out their fundraising options. They've shifted as much money as they can over from uh, the part of the rate that has to do with recruitment and uh, training and screening and certification of foster parents and the uh, support for those foster parents. And they can't increase caseloads, and so they're ca kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. So our request is very simple, uh, and it's, a, and it's a, a modest request is to increase the social work component of the FFA rate to support an hourly wage of $23.91 an hour. That's it. Um, we think this is particularly key because you've heard about KDA and you've heard about therapeutic foster care and you've heard reference to multidimensional treatment foster care and intensive treatment foster care. These are the agencies that are going to provide uh, the, the yeoman share of, the, of, of these new services as alternatives to, to residential care. We're at a point now where we're weakening them substantially, and their capacity then to be able to move and do these new things will be significantly jeopardized. Thank you very much. Ms. Hernandez? Hi. Um, just to mention, uh, Kyle Spore Leader will not be joining us. I'll speak for both of us. Thank you. I'm the policy coordinator for California Youth Connection. CYC is comprised of over 600 current and former foster youth who want to make a positive change in the foster care system. Today, I'd like to echo our members' recommendations in this, within the CCR process. Um, our recommendations are centered around the group home staff qualifications. There's two components to that. The first one being the age requirement, and the second one being the education requirement. Our members feel that there's a specific maturity and skill set needed to handle, handle the unique needs of foster youth, but also the goal of CCR is that group homes are going to be short and intensive placements. If that's truly the goal and this is truly a reform project, you would need better qualified staff to handle those intensive services. We understand that if you have more qualified staff, higher educated, you have to pay them more, but we think it's worthwhile, as we mentioned, that group homes are not the ideal place to be growing up, um, especially when there's already abuse and neglect that have happened to that youth. Um, we thank CDSS and um, the legislature for um, allowing youth voice at the table, but we just want to um, for further that youth engagement um, and within KDA and CCR, there's a lot of talk about teaming and all the stakeholders at the table. We would just like one of the outcomes for CCR that the youth voice really be taken seriously as, you know, one of the, the key player at the table and that it's a paradigm shift within the system that the youth should be asked, you know, their opinion on their placements and the services that they're receiving. They have, you know, opinions about the services they're receiving and you can actually get a lot of information by asked by simply asking the youth. So we just want to continue our mantra that the youth need to be presented with opportunities to share their opinion and weigh in on these life decisions. Thank you. Thank you for the ex excellent, excellent presentation and the excellent suggestion. Thank you for being here. All right, do you have any questions, Senator Monning, for this panel? I think just to thank you all for your relative and respective uh, organizational work, these inputs are really helpful to us to get kind of the, the real insight. Um, but it does all seem to turn around budget and investment, um, both for providers and for youth, this disparity between what a young person's eligible for and their support based on the placement seems counterintuitive to what we state our objectives are. So thank you for the, the insight and input. Thank you for your excellent presentations. I know we'll be continuing to talk with all of you. Thank you very much. And now it's time for public comment. 
If we could please keep comments to one minute each, please. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Tia Orr on behalf of the Service Employees International Union. Um, first, I would like proposals. Sorry. It's the microphone. We are in support of the proposals that you just heard. I am probably speaking a little bit out of order right now, so I apologize before I get started. I should have spoken on the realignment section when there was a child welfare service overview. Um, SEIU, as you know, represents about 10,000 social workers statewide. Um, these social workers work on behalf of you every day to protect abused and neglected children. Um, the realignment growth money, I think we're very, very excited about. It's the first time that the child welfare service agency is going to be seeing some increases in funds within in their agency and our social workers are desperately seeking some relief on their caseloads. Caseloads have been a major problem for social workers for quite some time. I think all of you know that um, and we're hoping that with the realignment growth funds counties will focus on addressing caseloads and not put money in rainy day funds and, and, st and stick it away in some type of savings account which we've seen in Los Angeles County that prompted a citywide strike resulting in about 450 social workers being hired. We want to ensure that counties really pay attention to this so that we can achieve the outcomes you heard described today um, and specifically we would like to request that the Department of Social Services start collecting data on caseloads and use that data to compare to the outcomes that are already codified that you heard described today so we can actually see if caseloads affect achieving those outcomes. Those outcomes look like reunification, timeliness in making sure kids get seen in time, making sure kids aren't in the program in time. So we'll ask for that request and please um, um, try to address caseloads if we can. Thank you very much. One minute, please. <laughs> Hello, my name is Farrah McDade-Ting with the California State Association of Counties. I wanted to support the um, proposals set forth by Frank Mecca from CWDA. We are in strong support of both the foster and kinship care supportive services augmentation as well as the CSEC augmentation. Our child welfare services departments are dealing with this population. It's exploding. It's both boys and girls and um, we need to uh, address this issue um, as it's happening. So we support both of those proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Jody Langs. I'm with West Coast Children's Clinic in Alameda County. We provide mental health services to over 1,500 youth per year in the county. Um, and one of our specialized programs specifically serves sexually exploited youth. We serve over 100 youth um, per year in that program. 79% um, of those um, young people have a history of child welfare involvement. So we know these youth are already largely involved with the child welfare system. At the same time, 80% of our youth have been incarcerated. Um, so while we believe, we believe there needs to be a shift in the way that we're, that we're treating victims, of serialized child rape and treating them in the child welfare system rather than uh, the juvenile justice system. A lot of times our youth go to juvenile hall and are oftentimes languishing there for months. Um, we know the child welfare system was designed to protect, to protect children, um, and help them recover from abuse, um, and we strongly support the CWDA proposal to bolster uh, the child welfare system. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Walker. I'm an attorney at the National Center for Youth Law in Oakland. We are a nonprofit organization advocating on behalf of low-income youth. Um, we strongly support the county's proposal to increase capacity to serve CSEC. Um, the request is a critical step towards more effectively and appropriately serving these children through a victim-centered approach. This proposal is a recognition that the children bought and sold for sex on a daily basis and exposed to unimaginable trauma and violence are victims of abuse and neglect and should be served through the system that is most appropriate for them. Youth who have endured complex trauma require intensive and individualized services to heal. This necessitates uh, specially trained social workers and mentors to engage them. This proposal would address the needs and begin equip equipping the child welfare system to serve this population. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to support the county's request to address this pressing need. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Laura Heinz. I am CEO of Stanford Youth Solutions, which is formerly known as Stanford Home for Children. I actually support all of the recommendations that were put forward today by the panel. Um, our agency is committed to providing an alternative to institutional care for young people, for children that have gone from home to home to home or failed out of group homes. And so we serve kids all along that continuum but we keep them in 
family homes in the community. One of our programs is foster care, and we have highly skilled foster parents that we work with, and we have to train our social workers who come straight out of school on trauma-informed care so that they're effective with the foster families. With, those, with that training, our social workers were able to really support our foster families. Unfortunately, last year we lost all but one of our social workers. That disrupts our permanency plans with our kids. It hurts our kids. Their time is ticking. Their childhood is short. And we also have to start all over with the re-engagement of the foster family and the young person. So specifically, I ask for your support in the interim rate increase. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Roberts, uh, the founder and uh, CEO for the Family Care Network that serves on the California Central Coast. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here. We support all of the funding initiatives that are before your committee right now. Um, second is it really is uh, about the children and youth and as a foster care and a therapeutic foster care provider um, this FFA interim rate increase is extremely significant and important. We've lost over 50 percent of our social workers in the last year and it has a negative impact. I appreciate Mr. Mecca's comments in terms of the need for more foster families to support them, to encourage them, to be available 24-7. That's what we do by default. And, and lastly, I'm concerned that um, with a diminished volume of foster families throughout the state, because of some of these budget issues, that we have really, really diminished the pool of foster families that we need to draw on to implement therapeutic foster care statewide. I've been a participant in that process with the KDA level, and I'm concerned minute, that please. we cannot do it if we do not have the families. So I appreciate your support for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Senators, my name is Jay Berlin. I'm the founder and executive director of Alternative Family Services. To, to my knowledge, the first foster family agency in California started my agency in 1973, 41 years ago. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of the measure for FFA social, worker and I, uh, social workers, and I want to limit myself to things that maybe other people won't say. I want to be very clear that this is an, an interim measure only. But we have been enthusiastic participants in the CCR. It's our understanding that the CCR final recommendations will include new funding structures for the entire FFA industry as well as new uh, mandates to do the work. We look forward to working more with natural families, biological families, and others. Our uh, proposal here is only to bridge the gap between now and, and the expected three years when the CCR will be implemented. It's important uh, for you to know that it's not a long-term measure and it's not a very big ask. Uh, Senator Munning uh, uh, previously had asked questions about system capacity. We are very concerned that uh, paying a $31,000 a year salary to, to a social worker in the Bay Area absolutely, you know, does not work, and our system will be greatly eroded and maybe not have much capacity uh, uh, to deliver services when the CCR is implemented three One years minute. down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rita Washington. I'm the program director for Vallejo Office for Alternative Family Services. And I'm in support of the increase for FFA social workers. It would allow the children that we're working with to continue to have stability with having a social worker, see them from the beginning to the end. And we know that does have an impact on the children. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Sam Smalls, and I'm a board member of Alternative Family Services, actually just since January of 2014. Um, in my capacity as a board member and as the chair of the Finance Committee, I, I see what AFS is trying to do in terms of being self-supportive, and uh, there's just so much that it can do with an underfunded foster care uh, program. So. The interim rate increase really would make a significant difference to what we're trying to do um, for the kids in Northern California. So thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Thomas, and I work for Alternative Family Services in Vallejo. And I wasn't going to stand up, but I see all the people in the room standing, and I also want to show my support. So I'm here to say that I do support the interim increase for, so, uh, for social workers, because it is all about the children. And 
this is a 24-7 job that they do. I see it every day. It's from morning, noon, night, and it's very important that they are compensated because in between all of that, supporting the foster children, they have their own families that they also have to support as well. So hopefully that um, you'll hear this and take this to heart. And like everyone else here, I support it strongly. Thank you for your time. Thank you for speaking up. Good afternoon, Rebecca Gonzalez with the National Association of Social Workers, California chapter. Um, we also support all of the proposals. I think they're all incredibly worthy and I think taken together, it's a small investment to improve the system. Um, I am also here just uh, specifically to uh, speak about the FFA interim increase. Um, as you know, probably know, no one goes into social work for the salaries, but this is really um, an imbalance in this system, and it's hard for retention, as you've heard, and it also hurts the children. I also want to second the comment made about um, caseload. Uh, you know, that's something we haven't talked about too much today, but that is a problem in the system all over, and I just wanted to second that call. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is George Razo, and I'm with Hathaway Sycamores. We are out of Pasadena in LA County, and we're here in support of the FFA social worker rate increase. And I ask, you, I ask that you guys do the same as well. Um, it's been really hard to uh, retain our social workers. In the past year, I've lost two social workers, and we're still in the process of looking for qualified social workers. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Roberto Favela. I'm Director of Foster Care and Adoption Services with EMQ Families First. We provide these services in 25 counties in Central and Northern California. Our agency fully supports all the measures that are proposed here today. Particularly, we need to address the interim rate increase, which is handicapping the workforce we need to address these children. These are children that used to be in residential and foster care placements, and you've heard the progress that people have made but we need a workforce that is skilled and maintained and capable of serving these children in the community and keep them in the community in these foster homes. So I appreciate your support and thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Susanna Niffen with Children Now. And I just wanted to remind us that even in hectic budget times where we start to forget, foster children have to be your number one priority. They are the state's children by law and they have to come first. Each of these are very bu uh, modest budget requests. Even if you funded them all, it'd be around $100 million, which is not very much in a, in a year of surpluses. I just want to really implore you not to make these young people choose between the right provider, the right services, or finding permanency. Fund each and every one of these because they're all necessary. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Monty and Martha Guerrero representing the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, and we are in strong support of the two budget proposals that Mr. Mecca presented, um, the Child Welfare Services for Child Victims of Commercial Sexual Ex Exploitation and Foster Parent Recruitment, Retention, and Support. These are um, uh, budget items that are seriously needed in Los Angeles County, and we appreciate your support for those. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Ramirez. I'm with Lily Put Children's Services. I've um, been with the agency for 21 years, and we do permanency-focused foster care, adoptions, kinship care, and family finding. And I have to tell you, in the 21 years, I have not found it more difficult to recruit and retrain and um, train social workers. They're master's level, as by state regulations. We cannot retain our workers. I'm losing three this month. We've posted, and I haven't received any resumes. Um, the type of work that's needed, our kids are traumatized. They come from abuse and neglect. Our families need an immense amount of support to provide permanency for our children. Our children have complex trauma issues that need um, ongoing um, help and support. So I really please implore you to strongly um, think about this issue uh, for the interim, interim increase for FFA social workers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your work. Hello, my name is Amy Heilman, and I'm uh, the program uh, director of foster care and adoption programs at Children's Bureau in Los Angeles County. <clears throat> We're one of the oldest uh, foster care agencies uh, in, in the country, um, and since uh, that time, uh, we've worked with many, many children. 
and families. And over the last 10 years, we have not received a rate increase through the foster care funding. Um, and currently, we are going to be running into a budget deficit uh, because of these issues and going to be losing social work staff. And so we uh, ask for you to support the interim rate increase. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Patricia Lyles from the San Bernardino Riverside area, and I represent um, Seneca Center that covers most of California with various programs. I am an FFA social worker, and I'm able to do this um, because I retired from the San Bernardino County Department of Public Social Services after 27 years. I stayed home for a few months and had to return to my work. I love my work, and I serve families and children. Um, FFA social workers spend more time with foster families than a county social worker. Um, the county contracts to us. Um, we are in the home at least twice a month, if not weekly. And um, we also provide the support our foster parents and adoptive parents need to parent our children. Thank you. Thank you for your service, and thanks for coming out of retirement. My name is Sherry Paxton from San Bernardino County. I'm an adoptive parent of five. Um, I'm here speaking about uh, increase of funding for the foster family agencies for the FFAs. Patty is my FFA social worker. I've worked with her for over four years. In 2011, we adopted our son, Michael. He was 12 years old. A year later, we adopted four more little teeny ones that we weren't expecting. We went back for one or two and Patty got us four. So um, in that time, I've seen firsthand the importance of having a high quality FFA. Um, there's been multiple times that we've had to call our FFA worker, Patty, um, all times of the day and night, weekends, to help us deal with situations um, that we were not prepared for. She would leave her house, come and meet us and, and help us deal with these situations. She has always called us right back, helped us walk through anything that we needed. Um, the process of adopting from the foster care system can be very confusing and overwhelming for the foster parents, as we found out. Um, you have multiple social workers, copious amounts of paperwork, especially if you're adopting five. It's like this much. Um, she helped us at every step, helping us understand the terms, the, everything that we needed to do and then helping to be our personal advocate for communicating with birth parents, county social workers, lawyers, school personnel, and medical personnel. It was invaluable to us, and I sincerely feel that we may have actually given up had we had to do this on our own. So we're very much in support of raising Thank the increase. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thanks for your service. I'm um, just going to encourage people to try to keep it around one minute um, out of respect for everybody else. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sarah Neal, and I'm actually her partner. Uh, so I adopted five kids from foster care, and um, they're all special needs children. Very, very difficult <laughs> things to handle that we did, weren't aware of. But without um, the help of our FFA uh, social worker and her group, uh, we definitely would have made it. Um, we did have some good county social workers as well. But um, I do feel that the FFA, FFA social workers um, are very personal in their support to the families. Um, they've supported my kids. My kids love my social worker, and, you know, she comes to events that she doesn't even need to come to. She spends more time with other families than she spends with her own family, and she definitely deserves a raise. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here today.